Good morning. I uh, appreciate uh, everybody being here. Uh, first, just like to say we're all very saddened and uh, uh, up, very upset about what's happened with our Marines. Uh, I know it's something that's still unfolding the story, but it's very uh, troublesome. Our, you know, uh, our thoughts and prayers are with the Marines, all of us. So it's a, it's a big issue. And uh, when I asked the Chairman of Homeland Security to come down here, we weren't thinking about this, but that story broke just as we got on the plane and, and uh, moved down here to Sarasota. But as many of you know, uh, the President was here on 9-11, uh, five minutes from here. The pilots were trained down in Venice in this area. And I just thought I've had an opportunity to work with the Chairman. I've traveled, I've been with the Prime Minister in Israel with him. I've been to Afghanistan with him. We were in Istanbul. And I wanted him to hear firsthand from our communities, get your questions, your comments, our first responders. And I'd like to give all of our first responders, let's give them all a big round of applause real quickly. Uh, the chairman, uh, Mike McCall, is a six-term uh, member of Congress from Austin, Texas. He's always been a good friend and a mentor to me. He's been chairman of Homeland Security for the last three years. I think he's got another three years. He's doing an incredible job. He leads the effort on the war on terror. And uh, obviously, the number one issue that any member of Congress is either thinking about or needs to be thinking about, especially after, again, what happened yesterday, and then you look at Fort Hood and all these other incidents, is it's about keeping people safe. And the national security is the number one issue. So with that, uh, Chairman Mike McCall, let's give him a big round of applause. Thanks, Vern. It's, uh, it's great to be here in Sarasota. Uh, it certainly is a beautiful uh, community, and I want to also thank Vern for inviting me. Uh, he's an outstanding member of Congress. Uh, as he mentioned, we've had an opportunity to travel um, both to the Middle East um, and to Europe. He, he deals a lot with trade issues. Uh, he's on the Ways and Means Committee. They deal with the tax code. I deal with terrorism. He, he deals with taxes and trade. So. When we go uh, on these delegations, um, you know, I'm the one that talks about ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the threats, and he brings the trade, you know, probably more positive issues to the discussion, uh, but they're both very important uh, issues. We ended up, uh, uh, just by you know, footnote, in uh, Normandy, which I, if you haven't been there, I'd recommend it. We um, um, laid a wreath at the memorial site. Uh, my dad was a bombardier on a B-17 and helped it's part of that air campaign uh, for D-Day. And, and so to lay the wreath, and they played taps in the middle of all the white crosses of all the servicemen who died that day, 3,000 on one beach alone on Omaha. Um, just a powerful uh, moment, and really proud to be an American when you see that. <clears throat> I don't know how they climbed those cliffs that you saw in the movie Saving Private Ryan, but somehow they pulled it off, and it just reminded me how great America is and how we're... Uh, no matter uh, what they throw at us, we're going to prevail at the end of the day, whether it be uh, the Germans <clears throat> or whether it be the jihadists uh, today. Uh, yesterday was a, a sad, sobering day. Once again, a, a reminder uh, that terrorism uh, is on our shores. Um, and my really heart goes out to the families of the victims. Uh, to have four Marines killed on American soil uh, on a military base um, is unacceptable uh, and we plan to fight back and um, Vernon and I are going to be <clears throat> at uh, McDill Air Base uh, this afternoon as he mentioned to well, I originally came down to get a, a tour of the airport to see what you're doing here but also 
Uh, McDill does a lot of really interesting <coughs> uh, things when it comes to uh, the war on terror, whether it be the drone operations, special forces, and really taking the fight to ISIS. And I can't think of a more timely visit than right now after what we experienced uh, yesterday uh, to see what are we doing to take the fight to them there. Uh, because if we don't drain the swamp over there, uh, we're going to continue to swat the mosquitoes in the homeland. Um, as long as that threat exists over there, so too the threat to the homeland. Um, so I'm looking forward to that uh, visit uh, and that briefing by <coughs> our generals. And then also, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the shooting uh, at, at that point in time uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but I just wanted to come here to, um, um, I think what happened yesterday, though, does demonstrate that it can happen anywhere, uh, anytime, any place. I mean, who would have thought Chattanooga? And, and um, you know, as Vern mentioned, you had the hijackers <coughs> that trained in Venice, not too far from here. And, of course, the president came um, here on 9-11. Um, I don't know if you've been to the 9-11 Museum. <clears throat> but if you haven't, particularly the first responders, it is quite a tribute. It is so well done uh, to the victims. Again, in that case, 3,000. Uh, on that day, um, you know, there's a fire truck inside. It has a, one of the original fire trucks from that day. Uh, it's a very powerful, moving experience. And actually, part of the World Trade Center is still um, in the museum site itself with a fire engine that uh, survived that day. Half of it demolished, half of it in perfect condition, which symbolized to the victims and their families that you could take a right turn and survive, maybe take the wrong turn and, and die on that day. I mean, it was that, uh, but the acts of heroism uh, by the, the fire department and the police department, uh, NYPD and, and uh, New York uh, Fire Department was uh, absolutely astounding. And it's a great tribute, not just to to them, but I think to all first responders uh, when you see it. Uh, I'm going to chair um, <clears throat> the hearing for the first ever um, on the week of 9-11 in the museum itself. Um, and we're going to have uh, uh, Giuliani testify, uh, but also Rob O'Neill, who has come out as the Navy SEAL who uh, killed bin Laden. Uh, it ends with his uniform, actually, in the back of the... Uh, that's the, the, the last thing you see uh, at the end of the museum, which I think is a great sort of finality closure to 9-11 uh, and to the, the families and their victims. But unfortunately, the threat has not uh, gone away. Uh, there has been this narrative out there, uh, as I got my briefings, didn't seem to be consistent that it, it's over and that um, you know, we've moved on to another phase. I know nobody would like that more than me. But the fact of the matter, the true fact of the matter, and I think what yesterday demonstrated is that it's not over. Um, and in fact, I would argue that in a lot of ways it's more dangerous. And it's a different kind of threat. Al Qaeda was more, you know, spectacular events, long term planning. Uh, Bin Laden was uh, fairly, while they were fairly educated, uh, they lived in caves and they had couriers. The terrorists today are very different. It's a new generation of terrorists that operate out of caves and, and not out of caves and couriers, but off the internet. And they send directives over the internet into the United States and all across the world to send their, their hateful propaganda uh, to try to radicalize individuals all over the world bring them to Syria and Iraq, but also radicalize them here in the United States. Now, Vern and I went on this trip to the Middle East. We met Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, in Israel. He's not real happy about the Iran negotiations, to say the least. Uh, then we went to Baghdad to meet with the Prime Minister and saw the, the situation on the ground there, which is not terribly positive. Uh, and then we went to the Istanbul airport, being in an airport facility, and they have 40 million uh, passengers go through per year, and that's the biggest concern from the, at what we call foreign fighter threat. That would be the person traveling to Iraq and Syria to, to join the fight, as they call it, and join the Islamic State, the Caliphate, and wage jihad. Um, the idea of them returning uh, is, is one of the homeland security threats that we uh, deal with, 
um, and have done a pretty good, good job stopping. But the fact is there are hundreds of Americans who have gone to the fight uh, from the United States. There are 4,000 with Western passports, and the total of foreign fighters is about somewhere between 20 and 30,000. Total ISIS fighters is about 50,000. And we'll hear at McDill about their efforts to counteract that uh, through uh, uh, airstrikes. But that's the one type of threat that we face is that person trained and coming into the United States who can pull off an act of terrorism, who's been obviously radicalized or radicalized before they go over. But the other threat is even more insidious because it's harder to, it's harder to um, detect it. And that's the, the one over the internet. And that's the one I think, as I talk to first responders here, I think is so um, relevant is that it could be happening right here. I mean, these guys uh, in Syria sending out these directives over the internet with thousands of followers in the United States, we're trying to track it. We've done a pretty darn good job. I mean, the 4th of July is a good example. I mean, I, you may have seen those like myself on television talking about there is a, there is a, there's a threat out there, a threat stream, and there was. But we were able to stop it. Uh, the FBI, NYPD, Homeland Security, uh, we stopped what could have been a, a devastating explosion at a 4th of July parade, which is what they wanted to do, which is what the directives asked for. Um, and we stopped that. You'd be surprised at the numbers if I tell you that last year we had over 60 ISIS followers um, arrested in the United States. That's more than one. ISIS follower rolled up per week over the last year. These kind of numbers are building, and the chatter's building, and the volume is getting louder. And that's my biggest concern is that, you know, you can, you can stop a lot of this, but when the volume and traffic is that high, you, you can't stop at all. Um, and that's what worries us, is what we don't know about. We do know a lot, and we are monitoring a lot and stopping a lot in this country, but it's, it's the ones that, that we don't know about that happen. Uh, that's what does, people ask me what keeps you up at night, that's probably one of them. And, and what's insidious about this is how it can permeate American society in almost every community. I mean, we've had people arrested. We have ISIS investigations in, in all 50 states, uh, including this state. And so, um, done a very good job, I think, keeping trying to keep state and locals abreast of the threat information through the joint intelligence bulletins that we send out, uh, both the FBI and Homeland. Uh, I know <clears throat> I've been on both sides of this issue, both on the federal side as a federal prosecutor and also as a, on the state side. So I, I know sometimes you, you feel like these jibs don't really have an, a lot of information or maybe you want more information, but it's about as much as, as we can possibly send out. Um, and I do get the, the classified briefings, and I have to tell you, I, I'm, I'm concerned that uh, it's become a more dangerous place out there, a da more dangerous world. Now, I'm not one of these fear-mongering kind of guys. I, I, I think uh, we've, we've countered this very well, uh, but, it, but it's unfortunately a fight that, that's going to continue. Um, I don't n think it's going to be over in my lifetime, but I certainly hope in my children's lifetime that it, it will stop. And that's my goal um, as chairman of Homeland Security is protect the American people and, and make sure that, it, that generationally, in the next generation, uh, as my dad fought the Nazis and provide a safer America and more prosperous country to my generation, that's what I want. And I think Vern shares that for the next uh, generation um, you know, to come. And um, uh, that is the goal. I do have five teenagers, by the way, so when it comes to Homeland Security, I do have some experience on the home front uh, as well. Um, but let me close with this. It, it was an interesting, we were in Iraq and um, the, the soldiers point out a structure and they said this was, um, I said, they said, do you know whose house that is? And I said, I, I said, no idea. And Iraq is not the most beautiful, it's a cradle of civilization, but not, it's kind of a desert, but you got the Tigris and Euphrates and you got the, uh, that's where the vegetation is. But they said that's Abraham's house. And I, I was, I was, uh, I was like, wow, that's, uh, 
that's the house where the three major religions came out of. You know, Judaism, Christianity, and the Muslim faith, Islam. Um, I'm an eternal optimist, and I, I, I do believe that it's, it's someday, and I, I hope it's in my lifetime, but I'm doubtful, but I hope that someday the three religions can live peacefully uh, under that house. And so with that, let me just thank you all for having me, um, and I really look forward to having a dialogue. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, let me... Uh, we're going to open it up and get your comments and thoughts. Uh, how Mike and I have always been pretty good friends, but we had a, we've had a chance to travel. As Mike mentioned, I'm fairly senior on trade. In every country, uh, you know, I don't care if it's Afghanistan or if you go to France or wherever you go, number one, they're interested in security first. And Mike and I sit in some of those meetings. And then the second thing is they usually want to talk about trade, commerce, business. How do we do more business together? But I've got a lot more appreciation for what he has to deal with uh, every week. In fact, this week he had a very brutal uh, markup on a bill. We were talking about that uh, yesterday before a lot of this took place with the Marines. But when you just think about this, and this is the thing that's concerning, and this is the new era uh, in terms of new media. Here you've got, just based on the little we all know, and we're going to talk about it later, but you've got someone that was naturalized as a citizen in the U.S., went to high school uh, in, in Chattanooga, one of the high schools, four years, went to college there, got an engineering degree, and then somehow gets radicalized, and we'll figure that out at some point. But how many folks are in this country with that, that resume? A lot of people. And that's the thing that is a game changer, and it's just my opinion. It's just what I see, the chance to travel him. That's the game changer. And I'm sure that's what keeps him up and others up at night, because how do you find uh, that type of person that flips out on you at, at a period of time? So that's going to be the, you know, the big, big issue from that standpoint. But with this, what I'd like to, to do uh, is just open it up. We're here, and I've asked the chairman to come in, because I'd like to get your comments, your question for the chairman or myself. And uh, go ahead. Thank you. Hey, my name is Kevin Sifferman. Um, I'm the Southwest Local Director for Concerned Veterans for America. We're a military family organization that advocates for freedom. Um, my question is, what is a bigger threat to our homeland, ISIS or an unsecured border? Thanks. Well, I, <clears throat> I think they're both um, a threat because ISIS can travel across that unsecured border. I uh, passed a border bill out of my committee. Um, I'm hopeful we're going to get that passed. Uh, in the coming months, um, but every day that goes by, we have an insecure, unsecure border. Uh, we and the problem is, like I said before, you don't know what you don't know. We don't know what's coming through. We do know what we catch, um, but we're not catching. We're catching less than half uh, from the aerial. Some surveillance we've had, we know that we're only apprehending probably half of what's trying to get in, and so we do catch what they call special interest aliens. And those would be, you know, and they're not, the numbers aren't that high, but, but they are concerning when you catch an Iraqi or a Pakistani or Afghan or someone from the Middle East trying to cross, uh, get across that border. And, and what are they doing? Why are they trying to get into the United States? Um, so I think the threat, um, I mean, I, I think they kind of come together. It's not an either or proposition. I think they, they, uh, you have to put them both together. Um, but I, will, I think the threat of ISIS, when I get briefed by the FBI and Homeland and the intelligence community is, you know, before the journalist beheading, no one knew who ISIS was. And now everybody knows what ISIS is. I knew about ISIS probably a year before that I was getting briefings on ISIS. And that, not to digress, a lot of people ask me, how did this happen? How did ISIS come to be? I don't know if you've seen the, the movie American Sniper, uh, but that's what you know, Chris Kyle, he was a Texan and he, I, I knew him. That's what he was fighting was Al Qaeda in Iraq, Zarqawi. ISIS, that was the genesis of ISIS, was Al Qaeda in Iraq. When we failed to negotiate a status of forces agreement, like we did after World War II in Germany and Japan and after Korea, when we didn't do that, and we had no residual force in Iraq. We had no stability. We left it stable, 
but it became very unstable because we had no status of forces agreement negotiated. And I do, I'm not going to get real political here today, but I fault the administration for that. You know, Secretary Clinton went to Baghdad one time. Uh, Maliki, the prime minister, malfeasance on his part, alienated the Sunni tribes, which we, under the Sons of Awakening, had brought them together. That created the conditions that caused ISIS. And the Sunni tribes have t had to take a, am I going to choose Maliki, this, this, you know, person, this dictator who's alienating us, or I'm gonna, am I going to choose my Sunni brother in ISIS? ISIS are Sunni extremists. Um, Iran is Shia. It's a very complicated scenario there, but that's what created ISIS. And why is, the problem is you have s nation after nation falling. So we have Libya. We had to pull out of Libya, and we all know what happened to our ambassador in Libya. We have no intel. We had to pull out everything. Our embassy. We had to pull it out of Yemen. Uh, Egypt fell to the Muslim Brotherhood. Now we got the military back in. You got Iraq and Syria. Uh, you got Iran's tentacles all over the place as we're trying to negotiate with them. Uh, this is why I say it's a more dangerous world. This when you have power vacuums, failed states and power vacuums. That's where terrorism breeds, and that's what's happening. And the greater the threat is over there, and the, and the more they breed over there and grow over there, so too the threat to the homeland. And so to answer your question, I know I've been talking for a while, how do they get in? And they get in through travel, either from airplanes, and by the way, they're still intent on getting explosive devices onto airplanes, or they sneak in illegally you know, past the southwest border. The, you know the third way they get in? The Internet. And that's the threat that is so concerning because it's so hard to stop that one. Terrorism has gone viral now. And this is a new threat of terrorism. It's gone so viral to, to be able to hit thousands of people all across the world. There are 200,000 tweets, ISIS tweets, per day. Now, I didn't know what a tweet was, but I got five teenagers, so now I, I know what a tweet is. 200,000 of those a day. How do you manage and control that? And I think that's the great law enforcement. It's a law enforcement challenge. And it's going to be a first responder challenge, as we, we saw yesterday. So thank you. Let me just add, uh, I know in February we had dinner. He had a border bill ready to go. And we're still working, and I'm hoping that we get that border bill up there. Yeah. I do want to mention one other quick thing, because uh, it gets overlooked when you look at securing the borders. 40% um, of illegals in the country our visa overstays for 38 percent, and I've heard different numbers. Uh, so they fly from Columbia, family of four. They go to Disney World. They got a 30-day visa. They don't leave. We we have the law in place, but we don't enforce it. So nobody goes looks for them. So 40 percent of whatever there's 12 or 15 million or whatever that number of illegals in the in the country is because of that. So that's one of the areas we clearly need to address. The only other thing I'd say is it became very evident and clear to me. When you look at the Middle East, look at Northern Africa, Libya, and those other countries, I was talking with the ambassador from Germany, it made it very clear that European countries are under, they've got so much illegal immigration coming from all areas because of, as the chairman mentioned, failed states. When you have a failed state, you get ISIS and ISIL and all these other groups that formulate, and uh, that's part of the battle that's kind of going on today. Any other? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, Bernadette DePino, police chief here in the city of Sarasota. First, thank you both for your service and what you do every day. Mine's really a comment about uh, director of the FBI, uh, James Comey. He's doing an outstanding job with communication and sharing information with law enforcement. And I really appreciate that because that helps us to understand what the threat is. We know what the threat was before uh, July 4th and, and we're prepared for that. So I just wanted to comment on how commendable the, the work that he's doing and he is personally outreaching to, to law enforcement uh, in many different ways. So I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah, let me say thank you for that comment. I, I think Director Comey is doing an outstanding job. I um, um, When I first got elected chairman, um, I was landing in Washington. They said, uh, Mr. Chairman, there's been a, a bombing, and um, it, was, it was Boston. It was a, the Boston Marathon bombing, and, you know, I'm, I'm – I've worked with law enforcement most of my career as a prosecutor, and I'm always supportive. 
But as we looked at that case, we saw flags that went up that were missed. Uh, and we have the Joint Terrorism Task Forces that when they work, uh, when they work, they work very well. But they're, they work differently in different locations. And what we saw in Boston was a bit of a breakdown uh, in communication. And so I had uh, Commissioner Ed Davis, the Boston Police Commissioner, testify before my committee. And I asked him if he knew that uh, about Tamerlan before the Boston bombing. He's got four guys of his guys on the JTTF. And the answer was no. I said, did you know that the, the Russians warned us that he was a terrorist? No. Did you know that the FBI had him under investigation? No. And you got these guys on the test. Did you know he left, went to Dagestan, radicalized, and came back? No. Would you have liked to have known that? Sure. You know, the mosque kicked him out because he was so radical? And all those things, really, and not to point fingers, it's, it's really a shout-out to Comey because he ushered in, I think, a new era of, you know, he one of his top deputies is a state and local guy. And so he's really um, very good about trying to uh, as is Secretary Johnson, I think, trying to do this outreach to state and locals, which I think, you know, in my job, I'm, I'm kind of the champion of the state and locals. And, and you need that um, kind of outreach. So I think it's improved uh, tremendously uh, under his um, leadership. The FBI got a little, they got mad at me when I elicited that testimony. They didn't like the fact that no one likes to admit they made a, mis a mistake. And I'm, I know 2020 is hindsight. In that particular case, I do think Boston is a good textbook, and, and it, you have to do the lessons learned, and that's in a productive way looking forward. You always, when something like that happens, you know, you do a post-mortem on it, and you try to study what, what could we have done better. And I think we've learned a lot from the Boston experience about so much of this, that in my view, particularly in, in New York, is the street intelligence that the, that the local police can provide. There are only so many FBI uh, agents out there, and there are a lot more police officers on the street, and they know the neighborhoods. They, you know, the FBI guy that rotates through is not going to know the neighborhood. They know the, the counterterrorism. I mean, they're trained in CT, and um, they know the threat matrix, but they don't know the local streets as well as the local police. And that's what I've been trying to bring together, because I think that combination is a force multiplier. Uh, out there, if you know, the, it's the local cop on the beat that's going to see something that doesn't look right before you know the FBI normally would see it. And I think Director Comey understands that that relationship is very important. I think he's really enhanced it, um, and I think done a great job. And I, I think it's absolutely necessary in this environment um, to have that kind of climate because who's going to be the first person to see something like this? You know, it, it's going to be the local. I mean, it, it, the um, Times Square bomber was stopped by a street, a street vendor, you know, so the local public has to be vigilant uh, as well. Had we known Tamerlan got kicked out of the mosque, this goes back to, to this bill. I mean, the timing is a little, I mean, we passed a bill the day before yesterday on countering violent extremism. And what it does is it makes CVE a top priority in the Department of Homeland Security. It had not been. There's a lot of rhetoric ab about it, but it wasn't made a top priority. And why did I do that? Because I saw this threat. Little did I know the next day we'd have this horrific killing of four Marines. But it's absolutely essential that we counter violent extremism wherever it is and see the signs of radicalization and stop it before something happens, before someone gets shot or before a bomb goes off. And part of it also is outreach to the Muslim community. You know, had we had the outreach to that mosque in Boston, just maybe we could have could have stopped um, that bombing because the imam would have told us, hey, he's so radical, I kicked him out. So it's just one example of how you can learn from these unfortunate tragedies. Uh, but we have to do that if we're going to better protect Americans. So thanks for that question. So, yeah, we want to get your questions and comments. Thanks, Chief, for your Oh, my name is Cindy Scarta. I'm a resident here in Lakewood Ranch. Um, just a couple things. I think we have a lot of legislation already on the books that I think Americans feel aren't being enforced. We have the Border Fence Act of 2006, Defense Act, that kind of was not fully funded. Um, also, um, 
when you talk about this gentleman who just committed this horrific crime, uh, and a lot of people are like him, uh, have a background like him, but his father was on a terror watch list. Also, um, when you say there's 50,000 ISIS members, to me as a proud American with the greatest country in the world, that doesn't sound like a big army that we have to defeat. Hitler was defeated in four years. I don't know what the size of his army. I think we need a will. We need to define the enemy of what it is and really get a will and a wanting to defeat this enemy. Oliver North was on Fox News this morning saying, it shouldn't take your lifetime to defeat this enemy. I know it's a different kind of enemy, but um, so I think as an American, I'm a little concerned about that, that it's going to take generations. I mean, um, I think, you know, we really need to label the enemy. That would help, but go a long way if this administration would at least identify who the enemy is. And with this, the border, I'm a granddaughter of an immigrant. My mother was from Sweden. Her grandparents were from Sweden. They came in through Ellis Island. They didn't crawl under a fence or a tunnel to get here. They came in the right way. And I, I think we do um, a disservice to the legal immigrants when we don't talk about illegal aliens coming into the country. That is a crime. And if you do that repeatedly, it is a crime. And those laws are already on the books, um, you know, mandatory by jail or fines or whatever. So um, as an American, I, I want to see the laws that we have on the books already being utilized. Um, thank you. Let me say, my, um, uh, I, I fully supported the Secure Fence Act, and my bill actually completes it. Um, and just one side note, it also provides a lot of aviation assets and technology to see. If we can't see the border, you can't fully protect it. You have to see where the threats are or coming in to, to stop it uh, wherever that threat is. Um, it does a lot of other things I won't uh, go you know, bore you with, but I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I, I've been saying this for quite some time. You can't defeat an enemy you can't define or call out. Uh, and, and the fact is, I mean, a lot of Americans, maybe they don't want to hear this, but it is Islamist. It's a radical ideology, and it's pervasive. And what does concern me about it being past my lifetime is that the ideology is so pervasive now and it's spreading so far now. And I fault the administration in large part because of a lack of political will to deal with it. The, the narrative was I ended Iraq and Afghanistan and I'm shutting down Guantanamo, but the fact is it didn't, it didn't end. And you can't sweep it away and ignore it. You need the political will to defeat it and I think that's lacking right now. What, what's going to be interesting this afternoon going to McDill is what are our efforts to counter out? You're right, it's, it's 50,000 fighters in Iraq and Syria, but there are far more ISIS followers all over the world right now. And so what, do we, what is the current policy? I would argue the policy right now is a policy of containment, not to defeat and destroy. And that's the problem with the policy right now. And that's from the commander in chief down. That policy, in my judgment, needs to change. And, and the other thing are the rules of engagement. You know, these strikes, if you ha have to have zero collateral damage to get okayed for a strike, how can you possibly be effective? I talked to the uh, ambassador of Jordan. She told me, you know, 75% of my sorties come back with the missiles. They, they didn't fire them because of this rule of engagement that's not – this is not being talked about enough, but I'd rather, I'd rather defeat them over there than have them come here. That's my homeland security policy. Um, and I'd rather, you know, if we don't go to Syria, Syria's gonna come to us. And I think it already has, but um, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Part of the reason we're going to McDill, I haven't been there in a bit, but there, one of the leaders on the war on terror. I want to get a better briefing exactly what's going on. Having the chairman there will give us a lot more uh, opportunities to really get down and have a better understanding. But I, I think, again, uh, what happened yesterday wasn't something we were thinking about, but there's a lot of other incidents that have reason why I've asked him to come, and I want to go up to McDill and also meet with all, our, all of our first responders as well. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Mark Douglas from uh, News Channel 8, WFLA. You mentioned that there have been uh, ISIS investigations recently in all 50 states, including Florida. Were any of those in Sarasota or the Tampa Bay area? 
And secondly, what additional things can you share with us about this shooter yesterday and any terrorism ties he may have had? Well, we're going to have a, um, a full briefing at McDill, and we're going to give a press conference at McDill on the shooting itself. Um, so I don't want to uh, preempt that, uh, <clears throat> if you will. But it, it, I, you know, it goes back to my point. Again, it can happen anywhere, anytime, anyplace. Who would have thought Chattanooga, Tennessee? But the fact is, they are, uh, there are cases all across the country. It's a little bit law enforcement sensitive for me to talk about this particular area, but your law enforcement knows about where these cases are. There are investigations in Florida, uh, and, and there are investigations in all 50 states. When I tell people that, that uh, there have been 50 terror plots against the West the last year, um, that, that we've had over 60 you know, ISIS followers arrested in the United States. Most people don't know this, and, and they, they, they hear about it every now and then. But in my job, it seems like every week I'm getting the, the notification that, oh, by the way, we just rolled up another ISIS guy. Uh, and it, it, would, it, would, it would surprise you. It's not just all New York or Washington, although a lot of them, Boston, New York, and Washington, seem to be the primary targets. It's happening everywhere in the country, and it's the pervasiveness of the threat um, that concerns me the most, and the ability of law enforcement to detect, deter, and disrupt. And that's the, the motto of the Joint Ger Terrorism Task Forces is detection and disruption. Um, going back to the countering violent extremism, we spend billions of dollars on, on trying to, to stop this threat, you know, and, and, and stop it from coming in and destroy that threat. We spend, we spend very little as a priority in countering the narrative and the violent extremism narrative, which is what my bill that we passed out of committee does. And what do I mean by that? It means that, you know, they send all this propaganda about how great uh, the Islamist fight is, the caliphate, how great it is to come to Syria and join the fight, how great it is to attack a military installation in the United States in the name of Allah. That's their narrative. We don't have a counter narr narrative to that out there. And the counter narrative, we need to de radicalize these people before they completely radicalize. And that's how we have to counter this threat in the United States itself. We do it through a lot of ways. I mean, the military overseas, but once, once the threat's in here through the internet, how do you counter that message? Well, it's, it's not such a great experience to go to Syria. I can tell you that. But, that, but you wouldn't know that when you, when you see the propaganda. Or we've all seen the ISIS uh, horrific, barbaric, uh, videos, the beheadings, or the drowning in cages, or the detonation cords. I can go on and on, the burning of the Jordanian pilot. It, these people are, are just evil. And I've studied, I've studied them for a long time, but this mutation that I see today is one of the most evil mutations and forms of barbarism um, I think we've ever seen on this planet in terms of w how they operate. And it is their design. It is their desire to take over this region and well beyond that to conduct external operations. For a while, th th there was a thinking that all they were concerned about was the caliphate itself. We saw with Tunisia and with Paris and Kuwait that that's not true anymore. We see with these internet missives that it's, it's, it's beyond that. They are looking at external operations now. We saw what happened yesterday. We saw what happened before the 4th of July. They are looking at hitting us. Uh, and we, can be, we have to be right every time. We, ha we have stopped so much that I can't even talk about. Stopped so much of this threat, but they only have to be right once. Okay, I think we can take one or two more questions. We are going to the port, then McDeal. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for being here as well. Um, Ed McCrane, I'm the Emergency Management Chief for Sarasota County. You mentioned the threat that's out there on the internet, and I was wondering, Oftentimes, when we have an incident occur, we find out afterwards that the individual had a Facebook posting or some type of a blog. Have you had any success working with the social media providers that come forward to you and, and indicate that somebody may be posting these things, or do you have difficulty getting that information from them due to privacy or whatever? Yeah, this is, um, you know, when Vern and I came back from our foreign fighter trip, it was all about the f physical kinetic aspects of training over there and coming back and then uh, this internet threat is a more recent phenomenon but it is the new wave of terrorism that we have to 
that I see as the greater threat right now than the foreign fighter itself. Um, and it is, you know, the ability under the Constitution to be able to monitor things in the public domain on social media. Uh, it's, it's the ability even to monitor these communications, even if we have a court order. One thing that has concerned me, and the FBI directors talked about it, is that they are so sophisticated, they'll jump from one Twitter account to the next. Once they know we're on to them, they, they get off that handle and get on another one. And, and they will communicate, and it's always, the message is usually very consistent, and it's attack military installations and, and, and local law enforcement. And I hate to say that with local, a lot of local law enforcement in the room, but that is their primary target uh, in their directives that I see that come out every single day. And so how do we disrupt that? How do you monitor it? It's, it's a, a huge challenge where I'm working with the high, the uh, IT, the high-tech companies, uh, right now is, is what's called dark space. And what do I mean by that? It means when they're communicating uh, over the internet, they're very, they're very smart. They will jump into a message box. If we have a court order, we can see that. But from there, they can jump into what's called dark space. It's, it's a platform, um, and there are many out there, where we have no ability to see those communications, even if we have a court order. Um, that is what the FBI has testified for my committee about in Homeland. That's what we're concerned about is the communications. We, we see a lot and we monitor a lot and you narrow the followers down, but it's what you can't see. It's that traffic. You know, I don't know what we're going to find out about the gentleman yesterday. If he was operating in this dark space, I don't know. Um, but very likely that could be the case. That's, that's a real concern, and that's, that has to be a technology solution. I mean, so your question is very, uh, it's very on point and very astute because that's our challenge right now is being, being able to monitor those communications in that dark space. My question is on the treaty that just came out of Vienna. And um, what I would like to know from, from both of you is when this is presented to the Congress and to the Senate, um, it, do you think it would be more advantageous for it to go to the House first uh, or to the Senate? Because I, I, my feeling is that it would get through the Senate, but not so much the House. I, I'm on the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee as well. So um, we had a hearing, and it occurred to me that um, this document was going to be presented to the United Nations Security Council before the Congress and the American people had a chance to weigh in on it. Uh, and I got a call from the ambassador to the United Nations not very long after my questioning because she knew I was sort of onto this issue, which has now been elevated. There's been a lot of talk about this very issue. And what is the administration going to do? I would hope they would let the United States Congress weigh in on this decision first. Um, if they send it uh, if they let the UN Security Council decide before the American people, that's not, that was not the intent of the law that we passed on the approval of the, of the deal. Uh, and it's, it, it flies against the spirit of, of that law. And my other concern is, I, I think, it, you, to answer your question too, it will go House and Senate. It will go to the House, then Senate. The President will veto it. I, I, I think we have enough votes to uh, vote a uh, disapproval resolution. He'll veto it, and the question is going to be, do we have enough to override it? But my bigger concern, or additional concern, is that the UN Security Council can lift those sanctions uh, without any guidance from us. It's the United Nations. So we're letting countries like Russia and China lift the UN sanctions before the, the Congress and the American people have a chance to weigh in on this. And, and that's, to me, it's just not right. You know, it, it's just, it's not right, but that's their intent. So the trains already left the station on this. I think those UN, UN sanctions will be lifted. And then what happens? I mean, to, to my, from my perspective, if you have half a trillion dollars in sanctions being lifted, where's Iran going to spend that money? And on what? Well, we know they can continue to enrich uranium under the deal without full inspections. We know that there's going to be a, a, a nuclear arms race in the Middle East as a result because the Saudis have pretty much said that. Um, 
But I also know that Hamas and Hezbollah and other terrorist organizations, the Iranians have killed our Americans in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we're going to be funding terrorism by lifting these sanctions. And that, from my perspective, that's one of my greatest concerns. Uh, let me add, because uh, Mike did a good job in terms of that, but we both had the opportunity two months ago to sit in front of the Prime Minister of Israel for two hours in Israel. Uh, he made it very clear. Historically, this will be one of the worst deals we've ever done. He brought up six times. We spent two hours literally with him and sat right across from the desk with him. He said, by lifting these sanctions, you're going to have a lot more dollars that are going to be coming into Iran. They're the main sponsor of terrorism and funding in the Middle, in the Middle East. And he said, Vern, this is going to be the worst possible deal you could do. Uh, and they're our ally. Then you've got, uh, I had a chance at a different meeting to meet with the minister of Saudi Arabia. Uh, they don't always agree with Israel, but they're 100% in agreement with Israel on this one, and a lot of the Arab countries. So the people, just common sense would tell you, we've got a great friend in Israel, some of these Arab countries, we've got good working relationships. When they live in the neighborhood, and they all tell you the same thing, this is a horrible deal, you've got to give some consideration to that. And it just seems like we're just trying to get a deal. You can see uh, what Iran's getting out of it, but a lot of people aren't sure what the U.S. is getting out of it. Lifting these sanctions, what he was mentioning, half a trillion or something of these dollars and assets and gold or whatever it's tied up is going to come back to them and I think indirectly probably used against us. Anyway, I want to thank the chairman for coming. I want to thank all of our first responders. We appreciate the opportunity and your input. Thank you and God bless.